A young woman she met in Europe described them in a poem as being relentlessly friendly and commendably confident in her own skin. And that opinion was shared by almost everyone from all walks of life who met her. From her peers to the senior citizens of the church hiking groups whom she accompanied on several expeditions. Her 16th birthday fell shortly after her backpacking trip to India with her mother. And when we asked her what she would like to have for a birthday party or a birthday present, she informed us that she could not in good conscience spend money on herself while people around her were living in poverty. The theme of helping was a constant in her life. And I understand it may have led indirectly to the reason why we are here today. If that is indeed the case, then I'm even more proud of her. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Firstly, let's start this video off by saying thank you for 1000 subscribers. How fantastic is that? I just want to say a big thank you for all of your kindness and all of your support through this journey and I hope that we'll continue to grow together. I love hearing your thoughts, your comments and your messages down below so thank you and keep them coming. Now on this channel we know that celebrations and happiness often do not last and with that note we'll be heading into the topic of this case. So I've thought about doing this case since I first started this channel. However, I had to kind of build myself up to talking about it. And yes, I know that we have spoken about quite graphic things on this channel, but some stories just stick with you in a different type of way and they become triggering, I guess, in some sense. And this is that case for me. This case definitely has stuck with me in terms of going out at night, driving alone, going out with my friends. I've always had this case in the back of my mind. Sadly, this case is quite similar to the Neen Boysen case. If you have watched that video, I'll link it here if you haven't. But it's quite similar to that case in the sense of how cruel and opportunistic the criminals were. But obviously, they're completely separate, but just similar in that specific sense. And before we get into this case, obviously, I do just want to give a warning. It is quite graphic and it is quite gruesome. So just be aware of that before we start. And that is enough rambling from me. Let's get into it. Intended for mature audiences only. Hannah Cornelius was a bright, bubbly, intelligent and ambitious young lady. She was born on the 13th of February 1996 in Cape Town, South Africa. She had incredibly powerful parents. And I say this because her dad, Willem, was a magistrate and her mom, Anna, was a lawyer. Hannah does have a brother. And Hannah went to Redham in Cape Town, which is a private school. She was exceptionally bright and she matriculated from high school and she left with six distinctions with an average of 85%. Hannah had many hobbies and these included playing the piano, going to Tears, which is an animal shelter here in Cape Town. She loved playing sport and she was just overall said to be very selfless as a person. So once Hannah left school, she wanted to go to university and she decided to go to Stellenbosch University, which is a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful university. And to explain the layout as best as I can, it's basically a university within a small town. So it's very close knit and it's very exclusive in that way. So you'll have little pockets of campuses within the small town. Hannah went to Stellenbosch University and she was studying a degree within the humanities section of the university. So quite different from her law-based parents. But besides that, Stellenbosch is known to be a very party central kind of university. And I might just be biased because I went to another university and we look at them as party goers. No, I'm just kidding. But besides the point, university students and alcohol is always a match made in heaven. And basically this is what the Stellenbosch kids did as well. And this partying scene was no different on the night of the 26th of May, 2017. On the night of the 26th of May 2017, Hannah Cornelius and her friend Chazen Marsh were meeting up at a boys' residence within the Stellenbosch area to have some pre-drinks and then they were going to head out to a club or like a pub area called Bohemia in Stellenbosch. Chazen Marsh was going to take his skateboard as the boys' residence and the Bohemia pub was quite close together and Hannah was going to take her blue and white city golf which her grandmother had gifted her to the Bohemia club. So Hannah and Chesden head down to Bohemia, they're having fun, they're having some drinks, they're dancing, and around 3 o'clock in the morning, Chesden's like, okay, he's had enough, he wants to head home now. So he gets his skateboard, he's saying bye, he's giving hugs and kisses to his friends, he starts heading out the door. 
Hannah catches him and she's like, where are you going? It's three o'clock in the morning. I'll give you a lift. I don't want you skateboarding across town. It's not safe. So Chaslin and Hannah head out of Bohemia and they start driving towards Jan Cilia Street, which is where Chaslin's flats were. Hannah and Chaslin just sit in the car park, which is opposite the entrance to the flat. They're just having a talk. They're just kind of winding down and talking about the night and just being friends and talking. Hannah winds down her window just a little bit to have some air flowing into the car. And like I said, they kept talking until all of a sudden someone sticks their hand through Hannah's side of the driver's window and puts a screwdriver to her chest. Cheslin turns to look at Hannah, who has a screwdriver pointed to her chest. And as he does that, another man comes to Cheslin's side of the door, opens it and tells Cheslin to stay seated otherwise the girl dies. They proceed then to rob Cheslin Marsh while he's sitting there. They take anything of Hannah that they can and then these two men who are at the driver's and passenger side of the car then tell another two men to get in the back of the car. So just to give context, there are four men now who approached Hannah's blue and white city goal. One of the men who had robbed Cheslin, his name is Nashville Julius. He then sees that the other men are getting in the car he doesn't feel comfortable with the situation and he runs away. So now with Nashville running away, the guy who had the screwdriver to Hannah's chest tells Hannah to get out of the car. They pull her and they put her between two of the men in the back of the car. The guy with the screwdriver sits in the front driver's seat and he proceeds to drive the car with Cheslin Marsh next to him. So the men continue to drive around for a little bit. They're driving around Stellenbosch and they're telling Hannah, we just want to use your car to get some drugs and then we'll leave you alone and we'll drop you off with your car. We don't want to harm you. So the men keep driving around and they eventually stop at a place called Halswuchte Pass. So the reason that these three men now stopped at Halswuchte Pass is that they wanted to take Cheslin and Hannah out of the car so that they could try and figure out if they missed anything while patting them down to rob them. During the second pat down, a man named Vernon Vidboy managed to feel Cheslin and he found his wallet and then in his wallet he found his credit cards. And Vernon said, you know, give me your pen. And Chaslin kept saying, there isn't any money in there. You're going to get nothing out. This really angered the men that Chaslin even bothered to talk back to them. So they pulled Chaslin out of the front seat of the car and put him in the boot of the car. And then Vernon then sat where Chaslin was in the passenger seat. The men then ended up driving to a petrol station just outside of Stellenbosch, where they told Hannah to get out of the back seat of the car and sit in the passenger seat because they thought it might look suspicious to other people looking into the car if the girl was sitting at the back with two men. So if you look at this video footage, you can see what police believe as the last video footage of Hannah being seen alive. She's wearing a cream colored jacket and it's very grainy, so you can't really see her face. So Vernon Vitboy gets out of the car and he heads to an ATM inside the petrol station where he tries to withdraw money from Chaslin's card. As you can see by this clip, there is no money being released from the ATM and this angered them very, very much. And it could be just because Chaslin actually had no money in his bank account or he did give them the incorrect pin. The men then got really angry in the car and said that the boy will pay one way or another for cheating or lying to them. The men kept driving around and they were looking for tuck that they wanted to buy but they couldn't find any so they settled with Mandrax and they smoked this for a little bit. They even brought Hannah into the house to smoke with them. They then dragged her out of the house and put her back in the car with Chesson still in the boot by the way. So they kept driving around and they eventually landed up in an area called Cryfontaine and they drove to an abandoned field near a sewerage plant. They stopped the car and pulled Chesson out of the boot. And during this whole time, Hannah was extremely quiet. She just sat in the passenger seat and looked forward. She didn't talk to anyone. She didn't look at anyone. She just kept quiet. And this was the only time that she kind of made any type of noise or any type of movement. And this was because they pulled Chaslin out of the boot and they said that they were going to hurt him and possibly kill him. The reason they were going to beat Chaslin now was because they said that he gave them the wrong pin. They pulled Chaslin out of the boot. They put him face down on the ground hands behind his back and they hit him in the back of the neck with a brick. Cheslin then turned around in pain and looked at them and he said the last thing that he saw was two men walking towards him with bricks. The men proceeded to beat Cheslin mercilessly and he eventually became unconscious. They thought that he was dead and they then put Hannah back in the car and they drove off. The men then drove Hannah to a painful field which was near Butleray Road. They then took Hannah out of the car. They then handed each other a condom and they proceeded to each take turns sexually assaulting her. 
they dumped the condoms next to the floor where they assaulted her and they put her back in the car. So once the men were done sexually assaulting Hannah, they took her and put her in the boot of the car. The men then drove around 20 kilometers outside of Selenbosch. They stopped on the side of the road near a vineyard and they told Hannah to get out of the boot. This was the first time that she flinched or she kind of hesitated to do what they said and they stabbed her in the neck with a screwdriver. She was bleeding profusely, trying to hold her neck and now the men started to panic. They then threw Hannah to the ground and they tried to look for something to hurt her with. They first kicked her in the stomach repeatedly. They found a massive rock that was covering a borehole pump at the time. They picked this rock up together and dropped it on Hannah's head twice. As a side note, during the trial of Hannah Cornelius, there was a farm worker who said that this particular rock that he used to cover the borehole pump, he could not lift by himself. He needed a couple men to help him lift this rock. So imagine how excessive this type of murder was. Now that Hannah has been murdered, it's now around 5 o'clock in the morning, the sun is starting to rise and the men get back into the blue and white city golf that is Hannah's. They then drive towards Cryfontaine where they see a woman walking to work. They then start shouting at her, catcalling her, she gets nervous and she happens to trip. And when she trips, they get out of the car and they steal her handbag. They then drive off. While they were driving around, they then see another woman just on the outskirts of Cryfontaine. They then stopped the car, pulled this woman into the city golf and drove off with her towards a petrol station in Brackenfall. Vernon Vitboy gets out of the car again once they are at this petrol station and he proceeds to take the woman's cards and go to the ATM. Vernon must have been taking quite a while because another man gets out of the blue and white city golf and comes into the petrol station to try and see what Vernon is doing and his name is Geraldo Parson. Together, Vernon and Geraldo withdraw 3,000 Rand from this lady's account. They then get back into the car, but before they take off, another man is seen getting out of the car, walking around it, and his name is called Irvin Funny Cat. So let's trace back just for a second. Remember I said initially there were four men who first robbed and attacked Chesen and Hannah in a car park opposite Chesen's flat? Remember the first man was named Nashville Julius who ran away just after they robbed them. Then there were the three men in the car who proceeded to beat Cheslin, sexually assault Hannah and then murder Hannah. And these men now are identified as Evan Funny Cack, Geraldo Parsons and Vernon Vitboy. So now that these men have withdrawn 3,000 Rand from this lady's account, they get back in the car and they drive towards Stellenbosch. Luckily on the way to Stellenbosch they drop off their hostage unharmed and they also drop off Irvin Funny Cack with a thousand rand that they have given him out of the three thousand rand. At the time that these men were driving around and towards Stellenbosch, Chesen firstly survived and some reports say that it was a couple that first found him but other sources say that it was just a woman that found him while walking but basically he was found and he was taken to a hospital where he spoke about Hannah and he reported the incident. Chesen mentioned the blue and white city golf and the police were now on the lookout for this golf. So while the men were driving back to Sillenbosch, it just so happened that an undercover cop was listening to the reports over the radio and he happened to notice a blue and white city golf driving past him on the way to Sillenbosch. So the undercover cop that was listening to everything on the radio, his name is Detective Constable Bulalani Siko and he starts following this car. He then radios in for backup and another police van eventually catches up to him and they see the blue and white city golf. They then put their blue lights on and Geraldo and Vernon who were still in the car notice this cop car now following them and they start a high speed chase through the roads of Stellenbosch. And as you can see near the end Geraldo and Vernon get out of the car and they start running into like a grassy area or a marsh area and Detective Sikor does end up detaining them and reaching them and, and he now brings his men back to the police station. So you know in detective movies where they try and put men against each other and they say, oh, you know, this guy said this, what are you going to say about that? And that's what they did to Geraldo and Vernon. And eventually Geraldo and Vernon spilled the beans and they brought in Irvin as well as Nashville. So the four men were now in the police station and they all pled not guilty to anything that the police were talking about. But police had them on CCTV and they saw two of the suspects driving in Hannah's car. The trial began and they had a very strong case because they had DNA evidence as well that were left by the three men's condoms that were found on the grassy area. Number four, Nashville Julius, who left earlier in the night, is charged with robbery and kidnapping, while the remaining three men are charged with murder, rape, attempted murder, kidnapping and robbery. 
And the aftermath of this case is just horrific to what happened. And when you think of cases, you often just think about the victims in the case. But the aftermath of this case affected so many other people as well. Firstly, Cheslin Marsh, who was actually a victim of this case, he dropped out of university. He became deaf in the one year from the horrific incident that he went through. Remember Willem and Anna Cornelius, who were Hannah's parents? They were obviously horrified and very traumatized by what their daughter had to go through. And sadly, a year after Hannah Cornelius had passed away, her mother, Anna Cornelius, passed away in a drowning accident in Cape Town. And Willem, her father, no longer practices as a magistrate, and he just stays at home now with his son. In total, Geraldo, Vernon, and Eben received life sentences, which, remember, is only around 25 years in South Africa. But on top of their 25 mandatory sentence, they also received around 100 years each. So in total, the three men racked up over 300 years in sentencing. And that is the Hannah Cornelius case, which did terrify the Stellenbosch community, as well as the Western Cape community for a couple of years. I think people still know about this case. And it is just an unnecessarily tragic one. And as you know from the cases that we've spoken about before, sadly, this type of violence is not uncommon. And I think it's just horrific, the amount of overkill that had to happen in this case. There was no reason for them to do what they did. And I guess there's no reason for any of the criminals we talk about to do what they did. But this case just hit home in a different way. Yeah, it's just a very sad case. Thank you again for all your support. And I hope you were entertained. And I will see you again next week. Bye.